Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. This episode, I'm very excited to bring you the conversation I had with Maisha Cherry. Maisha is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. She's also director of the Emotion and Society Lab. And much of her research is looking at the intersection of moral psychology, social political philosophy, emotions and attitudes in public life. She also has her own podcast, the Unmute Podcast. Uh, She is the author of numerous books, uh, which include The Moral Psychology of Anger, co-edited with Owen Flanagan, who's also been on the podcast previously. Uh, Unmuted, Conversations on Prejudice, Oppression, Social Justice. Uh, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. And her latest book is The Failures of Forgiveness, What We Get Wrong and How to Do Better. And that is what we talk about in the conversation. Uh, We start off the conversation by talking about uh, what is forgiveness? How do we define it? it, What's there and what's not included in forgiveness? We talk about forgiveness and moral systems. Talk about the narrow view of forgiveness and then the broad view uh, of forgiveness. We talk about what do we do with bitterness uh, and how, how do we not become cold and bitter and resentful. Uh, We talk about, is forgiveness really based on the actions of the person or the person's character and personality and temperament? We talk about what are the different capacities for different people? Um, How much uh, should we ask of forgiveness or should we expect from different types of folks? We talk about cancel culture, canceling others, and forgiving public figures. We talk about forgiving oneself and many other topics. Um, I have to say, uh, as I said in the conversation, her, her book was one of my favorites this year, Failures of Forgiveness. I, it's a book that I think is, or it's a topic that is, in terms of forgiveness is not talked about enough. And I like how she has this way of pushing people and, and making you think. And I think the best books are the ones that make you think challenge some of maybe your your initial priors. Um, how can you think about something that you do on, on a daily basis, maybe a weekly basis, a little bit differently? And I think that that's um, super important. I think we, we need more thinkers like her um, that are really going to push us to to think differently and outside the box and in improved ways. And she she does that with all of her books. And I'm, I'm super excited for, for, for this one that's out there now. And, um, and for all the other work that she has coming up. And so, as always, you can find this conversation, all other conversations at convergentdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. So get over there and, and follow and subscribe. And feel free to share widely with those that you would uh, know would like the podcast. And uh, definitely support Maisha's work. Buy her books. Um, tell people about it. And uh, now I bring you Maisha Cherry. I am here with Maisha Cherry. Uh, Maisha, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've uh, written a a fabulous new book. Uh, I I was uh, telling somebody uh, the other day that it was uh, one of the books that I've really enjoyed the most uh, this year. Uh, the book is called Failures of but I mean, Forgiveness. It means a lot, depending on what you read. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> it means a lot. I read, I read a little bit. I read a few things. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the book's called Failures of Forgiveness, uh, What We Get Wrong and How to Do Better. Um, and Okay, so let me ask you this. I got to ask you. I've been wanting to ask you this. It was intentional, right? That there's the sorry is here, right? I caught this, right? Is it like like an Easter if I, egg? If I say no, would you question like your sight and your your ingenuity? I would just think it's a really wild coincidence if it was that. I'd be like, wow. <laughs> yes, it was intentional. It was intentional. And so the the whole the whole kind of one of the fun things was can the can the reader can someone who who sees the book recognize it? Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you. I'm glad you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was at first. I was like, wait, why are they different colors? And then I said, oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that is this like a? Oh, that's cool. It's that whole hidden in plain sight. I love it. I love it. It's great. Yes. Um, so anyway, so before we get into the book and everything, why don't you tell listeners um, who you are, uh, kind of your professional academic uh, background, and uh, what you're currently up to? 
I'm Maisha Sherry. I am a philosophy professor at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, just got tenure there, so oh, I'm associate congrats. professor congrats. at uh, UC Riverside. Um, my philosophical interest is at the intersection of moral psychology and social and political philosophy. Um, I guess one might say more specifically, I'm interested in the role of emotions in our interpersonal and, and public and political lives. And so I've, I've just been obsessed with emotions for the last few years. Uh, about two years ago, I wrote a book on, on anger. Um, this book is, is about uh, forgiveness. And uh, when I'm finished talking about forgiveness, I will start writing a book on love that it's due out in the next couple of mm. years. So mm. that's, what I've been, that's what I've been up to and what I'm going to continue to work on mm. henceforth. So, so it, it does sort of kind of work like a trilogy is, is of sorts. It is a trilogy. Yeah. I would like to look at it as, as such. I mean, one of the ways that I'm trying to think about it is that anger and forgiveness, you know, response to wrongdoing. Mm. Um, it looks at the past and try to figure out how to reconcile with the, with the past. Um, but I think love kind of responds to how we're going to move forward. Mm. Um, so you think of kind of a backward looking kind of notion and then kind of a futuristic forward looking kind of, kind of, kind of notion. So I'm, I'm excited about all of these projects. Mm. Mm, yeah, I'm hoping people that will read it as a as a trilogy. Yeah, well, no, now um, now I'm super excited. Yeah. No pressure, but I am excited for 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 the for the, this one was great. The previous one was great, so now I'm really excited. So that, that's uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So okay, so let's talk about uh, this one: failures of forgiveness. So you, you kind of start the book by trying to understand uh, kind of the contours of forgiveness. So how do you give, I guess, a uh, an operational definition of forgiveness and and what's not included in forgiveness? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I want to start off by saying this. I know you're going to have questions about what I'm about to say, and I'll go in more detail later. When I think about, about forgiveness, there's a, a variety of ways that people have tried to define it and explain it. And if you look at particularly like the Jewish tradition, they have a, they have a definition. When you think about the Christian tradition, they have a definition. Even if you think about the philosophical tradition, there's a variety of, of, of definitions and accounts. And in the public imaginary, it seems to be that people have an idea about what they take forgiveness, forgiveness to be. When I think about all of those traditions, and I think about what current people think about forgiveness, they have a lot of things in common. Mm. And um, what they have in common, to me, is quite narrow. And to me, doesn't really cover uh, the cases of people saying that they have, have forgiven, right? So, um, you know, listeners would know, for example, they may believe that forgiveness is about letting go of certain kinds of emotions. And so when you have let go of anger, you have therefore for, forgave a, forgiven a person. Or someone might say, well, um, when you treat your wrongdoer with compassion or when you extend goodwill towards a wrongdoer, they might think that as a result of that, that you have you have forgiven. Um, and that's the kind of the mindset of, of people. You're letting things go, such as emotions. Um, you're letting certain things, things go. To me, those, those accounts are narrow. And I think forgiveness could be those things. And in certain kinds of cases, they are. But I think there are other ways in which people can forgive. That doesn't cover that, those cases, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that person have not engaged in, in forgiveness. So my account of forgiveness is quite broad, um, but there's a formula <laughs> and a kind of logistic and a kind of uh, structure involved in, in, in when someone forgives. So I believe, and this is borrowing from and inspired by uh, the Canadian philosopher Alice McLachlan, that forgiveness involves a set of, of moral practices. And when you engage in those moral practices, you have a particular goal or aim in mind, right? And those goals or those aims is what I call kind of reparative goals. And they could be to kind of get relief from one's wrongdoing, particularly if one is a wrongdoer. To get kind of release, so you can imagine if you are a victim, you want to kind of get some, some release from, from, from the pain that you have experienced. Or it can be reconciliation. You can decide to go on or continue on uh, with the wrongdoer. But also later on in the book, I talk about how there's different ways that we can even conceive of reconciliation in that, in that particular goal. So it's engaging in, it could be anger. That more practice could be anger. That more practice could be goodwill. That more practice could be compassion. But it's not just limited to emotions. Mm. Right. Um, you can engage in a behavior such as um, deciding not to engage in revenge mm. towards someone. 
Um, you can get, engage in kind of a ritual, um, listic uh, kind of activity, such as you give someone the, hot, the, the, the head nod mm -hmm. or you shake hands on it. Um, or there's a certain kind of gesture, depending on your relationship with, with the wrongdoer, um, where you, you know, I know in my relationship, sometimes just saying we good is enough. Right. And you engage in those moral practices. They're not just practices. So you don't just forget. They are moral practices that you're engaging and you engage in them with those particular aims in mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will always reach those aims. Right. You can try to let go of your anger. You can engage in these ritual rituals. You can engage in a certain kind of behavior with the goal of trying to go forward in the future with a person. And it just may not work out. Yeah. Um, and I want to say that that still counts as <laughs> forgiveness. Um, you just weren't able to, to achieve your aim. And just because you weren't able to achieve, achieve your aim today doesn't necessarily mean that you can't achieve it tomorrow. And so, um, I also believe that forgiveness is, is a process and sometimes it's a, it can be a lifelong um, process, but I want to say there's something about, and there's something fruitful about engaging in the process itself. Mm. It's very, it's very interesting. I remember reading the book is uh, I'm, I'm feeling the same way in which I read the book, which was all of these like questions and these thoughts that I have of trying to try to dissect some of these things. So, so the first follow up here is with forgiveness, if I'll come to the narrow and I guess more broad view in a minute, but with forgiveness, is it always attached to some kind of implicit moral system? And if it is, what moral system, right? Are you, you know, are we doing a kind of universalist kind of morals, or is it more of a relative kind of morals? Because I could say, well, my moral system says this, and your moral system says this, and they are not commiserate, and so we're we're going to have not only maybe different definitions of what forgiveness is, but also kind of what's what's kind of behind or what's animating. Uh, what moral system is animating uh, the way in which uh, forgiveness is seen as a be in, in actions or, or an attitude? So how do you see um, the ways in which, which, which moral system uh, is being used behind, I guess, forgiveness in, in, in your, your broader view? So when I think about moral practice, I think a good way to kind of answer the question is first to try to make a distinction between just ordinary practices and those things that we call moral practices, mm. right? So a kind of practice um, that I engage in every day is I get up at the same time every morning. Mm. I go in and write for a certain period of time. Um, and then I get up and, and walk my dog. And that is my morning practice. There's nothing really moral about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's, a, it's a morning practice that helps me get up in the morning um, to get most refreshed and most focused. Mm. And to have joy in my heart after looking at my handsome, handsome, handsome dog, right? It's a morning ritual. It's a morning practice, but it has nothing to do with moral categories or even right or wrong, mm -hmm. right? Now, when I'm referring to moral practices, um, I'm not necessarily referring to any particular moral system. So in some way, and I wonder what you think about this, um, subjective, objective, relative, really corresponds to what is right, what is wrong. I'm more interested in just moral categories in general, okay. like moral activities in general, okay. right? Whether they are right or wrong is, is mm -hmm. kind of irrelevant for my, for my yes, particular sir. goals. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to my distinction about a, a morning ritual where you get up to read and a moral, which is a morning practice, mm -hmm. is very different from like a moral practice, mm. right? Where it may be the case, I can switch up my moral, my morning ritual with a moral practice such as, I mean, people do this every morning, um, where they pray. Mm -hmm. And they ask that they try to do these particular commandments for the day. One might say, well, that's a moral, moral practice. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that is the kind of moral practice we should be engaging, depending on what the commandment, like that's a... Sure. But there's no doubt that that's a, 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 more, a more practice. And the more practices that I'm talking about when it comes to forgiveness, in some ways... I don't think there's any kind of contest or any debate. Um, I don't think that's where the debate is, whether they are moral practices. Mm. I think the debate is, um, should they count for forgiveness? Mm. And I want to say, I want to say yes. I think that the kind of moral practices that people have thought forgiveness um, entails has always been letting go of anger, mm -hmm. letting go of hate. Mm -hmm. um, 
extending kind of goodwill and compassion towards a person. And they have accepted those moral practices, but haven't really been cognizant of the kind of other kind of moral practices that one can engage in. And not let's just say moral practices, even the aim, because most of the people thought or think that forgiveness involved the moral practices that I just mentioned, with the only goal being reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So if you don't try to go for in the future with your wrongdoer, then you have not forgiven. And what I'm trying to do is broaden out those moral practices, but also broaden out those particular particular aims mm. and to suggest that they're not just limited. The way that we thought about forgiveness, what it is, what it entails, what it aims at, it's not restricted, mm. that we need to broaden that, 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 that out. And I'm hoping um, that if people are still debating if the broad view is moral within itself, then we can have that, that discussion. <laughs> but I'm hoping that by the time someone finished reading the book, that they are, they are persuaded that this could count as forgiveness. This could also count as forgiveness. And they would know what doesn't count. Mm -hmm. If it's not a moral practice, but it still aims for those goals, mm -hmm. it may get you those goals, but we wouldn't call it, we wouldn't call it forgiveness. Yeah, I think that that's particularly instructive because you're, you're, <laughs> you're talking about a moral practice without giving it kind of this, you know, top spin of like right and wrong, good or bad or things yeah. like that, which is, I think, very helpful. Most people... I think typically, well, maybe not everybody, but many people think of morals as a kind of binary, and there is a kind of whole suite of things in which ways morals work. The same with with emotions. So you you talked about it a little bit. So I guess what is this kind of narrow view uh, that people are familiar with of like, well, you got to let go of quote unquote negative emotions, right? Anger or jealousy or or maybe rage or <laughs> or other thing, other types of emotions that people don't typically like. Um, and, and I guess what is, is, is the narrow view just that it's, it's this very parochial, it's a very linear one-to-one, -one, I have to forgive to let go of this so we can move forward and that's it. And that's what you're arguing for as, well, this is incomplete. If, if the whole of human existence is this way of, well, yeah, but there's different uses. There's just different utilities. There's even things outside of it that can have different aims, and we need to look at that. Is that simply all it is? Or kind of talk about the narrow view, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the no, I, I think that the, the incomplete, the incomplete um, claim is, 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 is accurate, right? So it's not to say, I call them anger eradicators. Um, or there's another category called anger moderators, where some people say, well, you don't need to let go of your anger. You just need to manage it in the right way, right? Um, I want to say they're not wrong, right, in that sense. What I want to say is that there's more to forgiveness than that, All right? Now, one might say, well, oh, Maisha, what you're doing, you're such a philosopher, you need to make these distinctions and, you know, broaden out these distinctions for distinction's sake. One of the things that I talk about in the book is I say, well, when you hold on to this narrow view, I mean, there's two things that can happen as a result. And one way, I think, just as an individual living in the world, engaging with people in which you may make mistakes or you may be the victim of someone who's made a mistake or intentional wrongdoing. Um, that if you only have one moral tool <laughs> um, to fix conflict, to fix wrongdoing, and we know that there's no such thing as one tool that can fix everything, then we're going to limit um, the way in which we handle wrongdoing, in which we resolve conflict, so we're just going to limit uh, our, ourselves and, and trying to reconcile with wrongdoing. But also, I think not only when it comes to us, and as far as that limitation is concerned, I think it also can cause problems. Mm. Right? That when we think that forgiveness looks one way, then what it does is that it, it restricts our expectations. It can also overburden victims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so one example that I give throughout the book is that if you think that forgiveness is always about the letting go of anger, Right? And that's the only way that you can forgive someone. So what happens in the family when you notice that your child is still you know, angry at their father for something they've done? And they believe, listen, I'm still angry at him, but I have forgiven him. Right? And I have forgiven him because I've changed my behavior towards him. You know, with, with kind of moral, morally, I've changed my behavior towards him with the aim of eventually one day repairing our relationship. And you're the parent and you're basically saying, but you're, no, that's not forgiveness. That's not what it looks like. Right? It needs to look like this. I see your anger. You need to let go of that. That's the only way to resolve the situation. So we can see we've just encountered a problem. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have the child who's faced with trying to deal with the impact 
of the actions of, of, of their father. So that's that's one thing. And we know wrestling with and dealing with wrongdoing as a victim is hard within itself. Then you have this external person who's putting this pressure on you, um, who's saying that the thing that probably took a long time for you to arrive at is not the real thing. So what, what, what could happen? Not only is there pressure there, not only could there be coercion there, there can also be a, a, a kind of another layer of resentment there that therefore gets in the way from the forgiveness that she's already engaged in. And it can create more problems. So, so not only do I think the, the tool of, oh, forgiveness only looks this one way, just doesn't, doesn't solve all of, our, of, all of our conflicts, all of our, our moral problems. Um, and there's so much more tools available to us, depending on our situation, depending on the wrongdoing, depending on where we are, who we are, and, and our relationship with that particular person. But it also can cause more problems than it, than it solves. Mm. So I'm trying to get people to rethink forgiveness, just as a, a theoretical uh, exercise or theoretical activity. I'm trying to get people to rethink forgiveness so that it can really help them deal with the aftermath of wrongdoing and also help them not to cause more wrongdoing and conflict in the aftermath. So in your broad view, what is what are all of these uh other ways or other tools that we have at our um, kind of uh, disposal of, of we can say, well, we can use it in this way, in this way. And, and how does, I guess, in the broad view, forgiveness can aim at relief and release and reconciliation and, and many other things. Kind of uh, tell us more about this kind of broad view you're, you're, you're shaping out there. So let's, let, let's just imagine it on, let's just deal with one person. And let's say that this person throughout several years of their lives have done what people who've done them wrong, right? And we can imagine that depending on their relationship, depending on the gravity of the wrongdoing, that in one case, the person may have let go of their anger and they have done it so they can get some kind of relief. So let's just imagine that's a colleague, right? So that's how they've done forgiveness. And then they're faced with another situation where someone has, has done them wrong. And let's just say it's much more intense. Um, they're still angry. Um, and they don't want to get rid of the anger. They think that what that person did was so egregious that it's just apt and fitting. Perhaps they read my previous book on the case for rage. They just think that it's apt and fitting to be angry so much so that letting go of the anger is perhaps to minimize the wrongdoing that was done. But this person do, do want to forgive the person, right? So what they decide to do is like, you know what? I'm not going to engage any revenge towards this particular person. And I'm going to do it, not necessarily because I want to reconcile with them in the future, but I want to repair my own self. I don't want to become what that person um, can tragically <laughs> make me become immorally, right? So, that's one, so, so you see in those two different instances, depending on the person, the relationship, the wrongdoing, forgiveness looks quite different in each, in each case, right? And that's what I mean by just forgiveness as a tool within itself. I mean, one might say that forgiveness put an S in parentheses, that even forgiveness itself is a set of, of a variety of tools mm -hmm. and way in which we can deal with, 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 with wrongdoing. And I've just showed you kind of two ways in which forgiveness can address wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. But I do lay out in the book that forgiveness is not the only way to respond to wrongdoing, right? Now, here's the thing, and I think this is probably one of the controversial things in the book, is that you can even reach the goals that I kind of set forth, the reparative aims, without participating in any more practice whatsoever. <laughs> so if my colleague on my job is being horrible, as opposed to deciding to forgive them, I might notice I feel a certain kind of level of stress when I enter into the room when I'm with this awful person. So what I'm going to do is that when I know that I'm going to meet up with this person, I'm going to take a yoga class before the meetup. <laughs> And what the yoga class is going to do is going to give me some kind of relief. Mm -hmm. So when I go into this room, this person is not to disturb me. Mm -hmm. I've not forgiven that person. I don't want to forgive that person. Mm -hmm. But I still was able to engage some kind of activity to get some kind of, kind of relief. That's another tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, now, of course, the, the kind of tool that I'm trying to uh, expose in the book is forgiveness as a tool or tools. Um, but it's not the only way to deal with, with, with wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's important for us to, to, to recognize because in the book, I defend people who forgive, but I also defend people who decide not to forgive. Mm -hmm. 
And I basically, you know, try to uh, get people to see that that person is not forgiving, not not forgiving because they want to wallow in misery. Right. Or because they are against any kind of feeling better. They could feel better. <laughs> Here are some other ways that they can feel better. It's just not forgiveness. And that's okay. Well, I certainly want to come to that. There's there's a few potentially controversial points in the book, which was the most fun to read. So I, I think okay. it's good because it, it can it definitely pushed me. I think it can push people to think in novel ways about things we commonly know. And I think really good authors and thinkers do that. So I, I'll, I do want to come to those. So I want to ask two things here that we've been kind of sort of, you know, uh, dancing around a little bit is, and they're big topics, so we can try and keep it sort of, uh, we can take the narrow view on these topics, which, <laughs> which is, um, so I want to talk about emotions and I want to talk about behaviors just as sort of categories. Um, I'm curious. I, I'm curious where, where you think about, um, again, people have written books and they argue and fight about this stuff. So you, you don't, we don't have to you know, go through all those arguments, but how do you typically understand um, emotions as opposed to um, affect, as opposed to feeling, et cetera? I mean, people have these, these debates, but what are your, I have my definition of emotions. So I'm curious of like how you're defining emotions. Cause that might be, and I hate, I hate, hate conversations <laughs> that just get bogged down in definitions. So I'll take what your definition is, but I'm curious of that because I think it's obviously linked with this idea of, of forgiveness and a lot of times, because I want to ask about um, regret and remorse and things like that. So before we do that, how do you kind of maneuver or work through kind of emotions generally as a category for us as humans? Yeah. When I think about emotions, I'm just going to lay out kind of what I take to be their defining features. Um, so, and I'm a cognitive, cognitive, um, uh, so I think that emotions involve judgments. Um, and as a result of that, they come about because of a reason <laughs> or in light of reasons, right? So I am angry because a person has done a particular wrongdoing towards me. I am sad because I did not get the job or the money that I, I, I wanted. Um, and so they, they involve judgments. There's usually, usually, or typically kind of some kind of physiological response. So you, they are things that one might say that you feel, mm -hmm. right? Your body has a, has a response to it. And so we know that fear is a response to, you know, the fearful, something that we consider a threat. And when I'm afraid, I feel it in my body. <laughs> I, I feel it. When I'm angry, I feel that, I, I feel, I feel that, that too. So we got the involvement judgments, we got the uh, physiological response. Um, one of the things we also know about emotions have to do with kind of their, their time period. Um, so they can come and go, um, but they don't usually stay for a very long time as far as consistently, mm -hmm. right? So when I say in my book, in my previous book, for example, that I'm making a case for rage, I'm not saying that an angry person is always angry <laughs> at every moment, at every time period, right? It could be the case that I'm angry after watching a video and that anger may subside mm. and then it may manifest when I see another mm. video, police violence, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just how, how emotions mm. are. I don't stay in a constant state all, all the time. Mm. Um, but it is the case I do experience them, hence the notion of emotions, emo, emo, the emotion part they do. Mm. Um, I also would say this is leading to the motivational part, that they also can be motivational. Now, there are some debates about, about this, um, and this goes back to kind of an aspect of your question about behavior, mm -hmm. that typically what people think about emotions is that they, in some kind of way, can influence or kind of can motivate certain kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. So much so that earlier kind of psychologists, anthropologists suggested that they were what they call action tendencies to the emotions that we feel. That when you are experiencing an emotion, there is a, a kind of behavior that one is likely to engage. And so in the case of, of, of fear, that one is likely to, to run away. In the case of anger, one is more likely to approach the thing that is making one, one, one angry. It's not to say that oh, that will always be the mm -hmm. case, um, but that is what might say typically, mm -hmm. typically, typically the case. And that would be quite different from moods, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. right? A mood could come about <laughs> a 
for no reason at all. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just wake up with a bad mood. And I'm like, oh man, why? And I don't know why. I just, 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 just it's, it's not a good day. Let's just go back to bed, call it a wrap. Um, and sometimes moods could be, they could stay a while. Mm-hmm. Unlike, unlike emotions. Yeah. And then you got like this other kind of broader category of, of, of affect. I'm not an affect theorist at, at all. But sometimes people put um, any kind of kind of feeling under the notion of, of, of affect. So I'm trying to think of a, of a like pain and pleasure mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> would be, would be an affect. Yeah. Um, so that's how I kind of make the distinction. Yeah. Uh, that's helpful. Those. That's helpful. It's, yeah, we're two. very actually closely aligned. I usually think of emotion as having a behavioral component uh, of sorts, um, uh, definitely a a feeling or you know kind of physiological component, and then a cognitive component, some judgments and things like that. And I, I also see a kind of at a, at a sort of baseline level that emotions have a uh, evolutionary functioning at, at least it's not just that but at least at least that's what they said yeah, right. yes <laughs> where it's i see emotions a lot of the times for at least for humans and maybe for other organisms as a as a type of uh again not only this but at least this a signal of you should investigate something it's not prescriptive necessarily but it is something's happening and you should you should investigate this at least. You kind of you can take like a, a smoke detector kind of analogy there of like something's happening. You should look at that. Make sure there's no fire in the house. So I think it's at least that. And this is why I kind of push. So this is kind of coming to my next question is, um, you know, when I was, you know, in grad school and in, in, in clinical psych and getting my my doctorate, I, you know, I, I did research on shame and and my, my advisor and myself we would always kind of get very frustrated in the literature about these kind of negative and positive emotions. I, I, I understand the categories, but I think a lot of the times people see them as good or bad emotions, right? right so right. shame and jealousy and anger sometimes are the bad emotion, the negative emotion. And really push against that to say all emotions have a lot of utility and they have a lot of, they have a lot of use in terms of, again, a, a survival stance, but also in our interpersonal and in our interpersonal uh, relations uh, with ourselves and with others. So this is my, my bridge to um, one of the things I was really curious to ask you about is most people think, I, I thought this when reading the book, wait a minute, I, I'm following you, but you can't tell me you can't forgive somebody and then not feel regret you know, or, 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 um, or feel some type of uh, resentment, excuse me, not regret, some kind of resentment towards this person or bitterness or harbor some kind of, you know, pent up feelings as if you're, 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 you're holding a, a charge against this person. You might be able to move on. You might be able to say, look, I'm fine, but I'm not forgiving you because you did me wrong. So I'm going to hold on to this, this potentially this uh, emotional state that could maybe potentially put you in a, a negative space. Maybe not. I guess the, the question is, is, and I would imagine that's a, 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 you know, the kind of rebuttal someone might have of that. So how do you, how do you answer this question of like, well, if you don't forgive someone, are you just going to be resentful and, and, and bitter towards that person or to, to what they did? And is that okay to, 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 to be resentful and bitter towards someone? So this is, so, so you just opened up a few <laughs> so several ways in which I can um, answer this question. So I'm going to try to answer them in all the ways that come to mind. So the first thing I want to say is, you have just painted a very negative picture of anger. Yes. <laughs> um, and what it is to experience it. Mm-hmm. Um, at this moment, there was a, another school-involved shooting. Mm-hmm. And it has brought out the anger that I've been feeling about lawmakers just not being proactive when it comes to gun violence. Mm-hmm. None of my family members were involved in the shooting. I will go to sleep tonight. I may have some dream because I've been watching the news all day. But I'll probably wake up the mor- tomorrow morning fine. Mm-hmm. But I will still be angry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And I will hope that what that anger would do will keep me cognizant and not desensitized to what young people are, and not just young people, there was a shooting in, Jack- in, in Florida, mm-hmm. another mass murder, racially motivated. Mm-hmm. So we have an issue of white supremacy and we have an issue with gun violence, and I'm tremendously angry ab- about that. 
There is nothing wrong about being angry about that. It suggests, as we just discussed, that I'm making a, a judgment about our world, mm-hmm. a proper judgment, a moral judgment about our world. There, are, of course, I'm going to feel some kind of way about that, and hopefully that that will motivate me to engage in a certain kind of uh, proactive behavior to kind of do my part to kind of make sure that some actions are are are, are taken. Now, I am an agent that has agency that understand moral tools and ways and self-care principles. So I know how to take care of myself morally and also physically. And I have people around me to make sure that that rage that I feel about gun violence doesn't turn into this bitterness Mm -hmm. um, in which I just decide to do something crazy or I can't sleep at night. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has that agency to a certain degree. And I trust people. to deal with their anger. And it's not to say that people don't wrestle with it and deal with it in a kind of way, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have the tools to make sure that we're able to moderate moderate our anger to a certain degree in which it can become become useful. I wanna say that just because it doesn't feel good doesn't necessarily mean that it's not good. Certainly. And I don't think being human is about feeling good all the time. Certainly. Sometimes we need to feel bad Mm -hmm. to make the world better. And me not going to sleep one night because I'm so angry (laughs) is the price that we pay to get gun violent laws passed in our nation. That is perfectly fine. Right. So that's what I I would say in that in that particular regard. So that's one way to let that's the way in which I want to defend if it anger. But you but you you remember when I said that forgiveness doesn't look like one thing. Yeah. And you got to kind of go into these these kind of states. And so. You know, one of the, I start the book off being very personal about um, what forgiveness have meant, have meant for me and particularly in my family life. And for a moment, for those who want more details, you can read the book. But for a moment, I thought that I hadn't forgave my, my stepfather because in comparison to my sister, her forgiveness looked like the typical kind of narrow view, right? The popular view of you let go of anger. And you try to do your best to repair the relationship. In her, in her eyes, I was not doing that. And for a minute, I thought, because I wasn't doing that, I hadn't forgave him. And I wore that as a badge of honor. And then I began to think about it a little bit more, because I was thinking about it theoretically. And it was, it was as if, you know, it dawned on me. It's like, oh, wait, hold up. I have forgiven my stepfather. Well, how do you know? Well, I wasn't wishing for him to die. <laughs> Now, I haven't spoken to him in years, still don't want to, but I wasn't wishing for him to die. My aims of forgiveness was, 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 quite, was quite different. So there was a goodwill that I had. There was a compassion that I also had. So I was engaged in a more practice and I was able to achieve these particular aims. But the anger, particularly on the anniversary of my mother's death, um, became very strong every other year. And if I held on to the narrow view, because the anger would come every other year, one might have thought that, hey, you didn't forgive your stepfather. And I realized that, listen, wrongdoing, there's an aftermath of wrongdoing. Whether that's regret that the wrongdoer may experience throughout the rest of their lives, although they have gotten someone's forgiveness. And one of the aftermaths of wrongdoing is that although you may have forgiven someone, depending on the kind of more practice that you engage in, there may be some more remainders left over. Mm. So in my case, I believe that I had forgiven my stepfather. I engaged in these, you know, compassion, goodwill towards him for these particular goals. But what remained was the anger. And I want to say welcome to human fragility and welcome to the aftermath of wrongdoing. There are remainders. There are things that remain after wrongdoing. Not everything is sunshine, clouds, and unicorns. Not everything will feel good, even when you've done the ultimate act called forgiveness. You may feel some stuff that may not feel good, that may make you feel morally dirty. But unfortunately, that is the aftermath of wrongdoing. And the challenge for us is how do you deal with that? How do you live with that? And I'm hoping that my book will kind of offer up answers to those those latter questions. So I'm convinced that I mean, I already was convinced that you're a very uh, brilliant person, but I'm just convinced that I I think that you're a brilliant person uh, that is more well-adjusted than most people. I think think most people would find this very difficult, what you're saying. 
very difficult. Mm-hmm. And and I, 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 as I was listening to you there, I was thinking, so I totally agree with you about your first example, right? You see gun violence, you have a certain type of, of anger or rage. I think there's a, 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 an adaptive or a good utility for that. No disagreements from me on that. And I think there's numerous examples that we see in our society where we should be um, animated, right, and, and kind of exercised by injustice that we see of, of, of various types, unfortunately. No disagreement. I guess the, the, where it becomes a little more, because that still feel, I don't want to say it feels distant or removed, um, because that's not fair. But it's more, I guess it's more at like the the group level or it's more at the like national level or it's more at, and, and I know these, obviously these horrible things happen to real people and, and many people right. that happen to families and there's, you know, degrees of separation. So I'm not trying to minimize that. But I was thinking a little bit more in terms of sort of the example you gave there about kind of a one-on-one thing. Mm-hmm. So the 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 problem i still i'm wrestling with on this is let's say and, and i don't have a i don't i'm not married to an answer so you you okay. you uh you 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 uh do your magic try to work your 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 ways of convincing me here if if i if i if i um have an indiscretion towards you i say something um we have an argument and maybe I, I take it a little below the belt. I say something kind of personal, hurtful, a little mean. And I say, well, you know, after I calm down and, you know, a couple hours later and I feel bad. I, I genuinely feel guilt, maybe shame. I would, those in, in that moment, those emotions I think are good that we have because that, that can spur us to proactive behavior and anticipation for not doing that again. So I think that there's a, a utility for some of those quote unquote negative emotions. Do you feel there's a space where for the person that's been hurt? So in, in my example, you, the narrow view would say, well, you got to forgive him. He apologized. You know, let's say, let's say I give you a good apology, right? I'll give you a real good apology. I say, you know what, Maisha, I was, I was wrong for what I did and for what I said and for how I meant it and how I came out. I'm greatly sorry, and I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that from, from doing that again. I hope you please accept my apology and forgive me, right? And you respond and you say, nope. I don't have to, and I'm not going to. That, to me, feels not right or wrong, but it feels... The feeling of it would be not good. It's not a positive feeling, and I agree with you. We don't always need positive feelings. It's not all rainbows and sunshine. Get, I get you on that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not disagreeing. But I, I do feel where this does... It's a slippery slope for a lot of people of this way of resentment, or maybe sometimes people aren't aware of it, this kind of like punishing. You know what? You hurt me. I'm going to hurt you back. I'm going to let you sweat this one out. I'm not going to make it that easy for you. And I want you to feel a little pain. I want you to hurt a little bit because you're making yourself vulnerable. You're, you're now saying, you're, you're recognizing what you did. You feel that. And and you're you're kind of you know you're you're kind of being on the on the submissive and say hey I was wrong you know and and uh, so now I'm I'm kind of on top of the mountain here and I'm gonna be like well I got the high ground so you know do you you see what I'm saying there and how do we yes, how yes, would you yes. say answer to something like that Let me say two things. When you've done wrong. And you recognize the wrong that you've done and you feel guilt and shame and you sincerely want to apologize and you go to the person to apologize. You are hoping that that person will forgive you. Mm -hmm. And that person says, I will not forgive you. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would say to that that person. And this is going to sound cruel. This is what I would say to that person. 
when we engage in wrongdoing, we communicate to that other person that they do not matter. When we engage in wrongdoing, which we hurt other people and wrong other people, in some way we might say that we've declared that we are the boss of, of things. So much so that we might even, with a contrite spirit, go to the other person with a little bit of residue of bossness to suggest that because we apologize, then that apologize is therefore going to make the victim say, I forgive you. Here's the thing. You're not the boss. Mm. Your wrongdoing deceive you in thinking that you were the boss of things. Mm. And to suggest that that person should forgive you is to once again <laughs> take away their particular agency. Mm. The world doesn't work that way. Wrongdoing can convince us that we can control people, that we can do whatever we want, and we can get however results that we want. And the whole process of reconciliation reminds us that we are not the boss, nor should we try to aim to be the boss, right? The reconciliatory process remind, you know, kind of reminds us that wrongdoing can have such a strong hold that we have no control over what happens, even though we thought we did when we engaged in the wrongdoing. Welcome to life. <laughs> Welcome to moral remainders. I think the lesson is that don't repeat that going forward. So even if that person decides not to forgive you, it sucks. Mm -hmm. But you're not the boss of them. Right. And forgiveness is a gift. They've done nothing wrong. Mm. Go forward. <laughs> Be sincere in your apology. But go forward and try not to repeat that again. Right? Mm, I guess my question that... Yeah, that, doesn't sound, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so this is to your second point. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. This is to your second point. This is not to suggest that people do not abuse their moral powers. Sure. And I think that forgiveness... You know, offering or extending forgiveness to someone, that is a moral power that we engage in. And just like any kind of power, <laughs> some people are going to abuse it and some people are going to misuse it. Right? Miranda Fricker kind of talks about this, of how, and Martha Nussbaum talks, talk about this, about even, even notions of, of conditional forgiveness. You can make it the case that someone has to do this step and this step and this step and keep doing this thing, keep the, and then maybe you would forgive them. So it's not to suggest that, that people won't abuse the process. But just because you didn't get the results that you wanted doesn't necessarily mean that they have abused it or they have misused their particular powers. And I think we need to make distinctions there, that there is a way for me not to forgive you and I've done nothing wrong. I have not engaged in a kind of retributive uh, misuse of my moral powers. I just cannot forgive you. Either right now or, I, or going forward. And I want to say that is okay. Right? What I do caution throughout the book is, um, you know, the coercion, the misuse. Be very kind of cognizant of that. Um, but the very act itself of not forgiving doesn't necessarily translate to those misuses and those abuses. So I'm right with you on that ladder and a person shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that just because a person hasn't decided to forgive doesn't necessarily mean that they have done those bad things with their with their forgiveness. Yeah, I I I I wonder here when somebody when somebody's there's two two parts to this. When somebody's asking for forgiveness, where do you you think I is the maybe it's both. Where do you think um I don't want to say who's the audience, but who's it for? So who's forgiveness for? Yeah. So if so, in my example, if I come and I apologize and I ask for forgiveness, all these things, am I doing that for you, or am I doing that for me, or am I doing that for both? Because here's what I mean. I feel like a lot of the times. So in this example, if you say I don't forgive you, whatever, I think sometimes people will feel. You know, they can feel remorse they can feel you know guilt and, and they can try to repair it you know guilt usually is a reparative action and that's not going to just go away with a quick you know couple of words or something like that but sometimes people will try and say there's nothing else i can do and you know there's nothing else that this person can do at the moment so we're at a we're at a, a, a um, standstill on this okay but i guess when going into it Right, oh, you know, 
I, I really said this thing to my I, sh- I should I should I should own up to that. And I feel yeah, I feel that. Okay. Is is it helpful for that person to say, I'm doing this for them, or I'm doing this for me, or I'm doing this for both of us? Like where's the kind of like um the the kind of the the spotlight or where does the kind of the the lens focus on i think in in the unideal sense of of when that forgiveness is is there yeah i like this question so when wrongdoing has taken place the issue the topic the tool of forgiveness is going to be relevant Mm -hmm. and what people are going to do to bring the relevancy into the picture is they're going to ask for it Mm -hmm. They're going to ask about it. Now, there's an instance, and these are probably the most popular instances when we think about asking for forgiveness. It's usually the wrong door will approach the person they've wronged, and they may ask for forgiveness. But there's other ways in which what I call kind of forgiveness requests can, can manifest. So in the book, I talk about how, you know, from 2012 with the murder of Trayvon Martin, for like several years, every time a police officer... Um, or a non-black person will kill another black person. At these press conferences, reporters will always ask their family members, particularly the mothers, can you find it in your heart to forgive this person or not? Now, those reporters are not wrongdoers, mm-hmm. what we call third parties. Mm-hmm. And they're not asking that the person forgive the wrongdoer. They are inquiring about their forgiveness. They're wondering if one day the person will, will forgive. Now, in that sense, Let's contrast that with wrongdoers. I think when, typically when wrongdoers ask for forgiveness, they are asking for forgiveness for themselves. Mm-hmm. I think when third parties, particularly in the case that I just kind of outlined, for reporters, <laughs> I want to be careful with assigning kind of intentions. Um, I think they're interested in the story, <laughs> yes, perhaps. Sure they are. So they may be asking for themselves and the stories that they would tell. But I think to be kind, they're probably asking um, uh, forgiveness as far as on behalf of the, of the victim. Mm. Right. Um, and I think depending on how close you are to the wrong door and to the victim, it may just depend about who forgiveness will be for mm. in that in that particular particular sense. What I want to say is that no matter who it's for. We got to be careful mm-hmm. when we ask mm. because it's relevant, right? That wrongdoing has happened. How are we going to mend things? How are we going to fix things? Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Oh, we got to mention it. We got to bring it up. And I want to say, hey, I know you're anxious. Right? I know you, you see forgiveness as a wonderful moral tool to kind of mend our world, but let's be careful here. Mm-hmm. Let's not do it too soon. Mm-hmm. Let's not introduce it too soon. Not, let's not expect it too soon. But let's also be very careful about the kinds of questions that we ask in regards to forgiveness, how we ask it, when we ask it, where we ask it. Because it goes back yeah, yeah. Uh, to what I was saying earlier about we think we are engaging in repair. Yeah. When we're asking these questions. But when we're not mindful of the kinds of questions that we're asking, when, where, how, we could be doing more harm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we got to, got to be, be, be careful. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I suggest is, given all the problems that come with asking people about their forgiveness and for their forgiveness, let's not, just don't do it. Mm-hmm. I think you can apologize and just leave it as an apology. And the person, listen, the person doesn't need to be asked mm-hmm to engage in forgiveness. Mm. My stepfather never asked me, or maybe he did, I don't remember, (laughs) never asked me to forgive him, right? You know, and to suggest that they need a question in order to engage in more practices, I think it's just disrespectful and disrespectful to to agency. And I just doesn't think that it latches on to our real experiences of when we engage in the practice of of forgiveness. So so victims don't need your questions Mm -hmm. or your inquiries. And given that they, we mess up most of the time when we extend them, I want to say there's other things that we can say to victims that can do more, more, um, that can help more than, more than harm. Mm. So I see no problem with apologies, but even they come with their risks of being very careful with the things that we, 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 we do there. Um, I think that we can even express kind of a hope for forgiveness, mm. but I think asking for it mm-hmm. just creates a lot, a lot of problems. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I want to ask this distinction I've been thinking about throughout the conversation about It's a tough question to ask, and it will lead to something I'm going to ask in a little bit later. But how much for you when there's a, a wrongdoing? So I'm going to keep this on the individual level for a minute. Okay. Um, 
in in I know you talk about families in the book, so with with uh, uh, in a in a marriage or or a union of sorts, and uh, you know um, if people you know one spouse or one partner you know has a wrongdoing towards another spouse or partner, or in families, you know whether it's you know different different generations, you know parent to child or grandparents or whatever. When that happens, and when people ask for forgiveness, or people choose to or not choose to to accept forgiveness, or et cetera, is it important? So there's two questions here. One, does it matter a distinction between behaviors slash actions and the person? And is that important? So what I mean is, is there is there daylight between well, this is my action, and this is an, a growing error area for me, but that's not defining who I am as an individual person and my temperament and my character. Um, these are just bad actions I'm trying to get better at. We're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. Or, or is it? Is it one of those things where, you know, Maybe there's degrees here. Maybe it is a continuum of certain certain things. You know, if you call someone a name, you know, in the midst of an argument, that's much different than saying something about, um, you know, I don't know, a, a judgment on your character based on some. You know, there's there's degrees maybe of this, but is it important to kind of divorce between behaviors, actions, and judgments on a person's temperament, their character, their personality, who they are? So I'm making a distinction between the, if you will, uh, traits of a person that make up an individual and the kind of behavioral states that someone, you know, just had a bad moment or whatever, they were stressed that day. And they just, you know, is that important to make that distinction between somebody's, you know, person and their behaviors or actions? No, this is, this is interesting. This distinction between who we are versus what we've done and is what we've done, who we are. Right, Right. And you notice that there's there's rhetoric. Let me for a moment go outside the interpersonal, mm-hmm. where you see people engage in kind of racist behavior, mm-hmm. and they're quick to say, "I'm not a racist." Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like character is just very important. They don't want to be painted as a racist, although their actions <laughs> have caused so much racial harm. Mm-hmm. They don't want to denounce the racial harm. They're so caught up in the character. Mm-hmm. And one might even say that that's kind of like American individualism, like our brand and who we are is so important and, you know, respect we want from others. So eh, what we've done, we can divorce that. You know, we have an obsession about about character in, 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 the, in this country. I mean, in some ways, there's ways in which I can answer this question of kind of a Aristotelian kind of notion mm-hmm. to say that who we are is what we do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we are our, our, our habits. I don't know who we are. Okay. <laughs> Right, if who we are is is what we do, I think that what I'm interested in is how do we recover from wrongdoing. Mm-hmm. Notice, I didn't say how do we recover from a wrong person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wrongdoing. How do we recover from wrongdoing? And there may be obstacles to that, right? And a lot of obstacles to that could be the person keeps doing it, and whether that person is a wrongdoer is another question. But that creates a barrier. Right. Into the kind of recovery that can that can happen, but when it comes to forgiveness, it brings out this this additional question about what do we forgive and and what does it mean to forgive a person for who they are versus forgiving a person for what they've done, and which one is harder? <laughs> well, well let me, okay, let me jump in here. So, what I think about is capacity. What is right. a person's capacity, and how we're um, discerning that or judging that? So. Mm-hmm. Um, let me give a kind of an extreme example. If if I if I get if if there's somebody that has pretty severe intellectual disabilities and they say yeah. something or they they do yeah. something and they say I'm sorry or they ask for forgiveness, I'm not going to hold them to the same standard I would right. hold to you or something. That's an extreme example, so I'm just using that. Mm-hmm. For, but the the point I'm illustrating there is capacity. Your capacity yeah. load, which is I think somewhat connected, I don't think entirely with how we think about an idea of a, of a, of a self or, or who we are as, as a person. And so this becomes really complicated with, you know, 
normals, <laughs> people walking around, our, our peers or our cohort, where I think we do have different discriminations. I, I'm using that word in terms of one thing from the other. Of, you know, well, I know, I know John and yeah, I know how he is, you know, and, and, you know, it, I, I, I'm going to go easy on him or what we do this in families all the time. Well, you know, uncle, uncle so-and-so, you know, he, he, he ain't always right in the head and, you know, he always just, he's from a different generation or we make these excuses and some of them are fair, some of them aren't, but I do think the underlying thing there is capacity is. If you know a little bit about their life or you know a little bit about some of the, I think, again, temperament, my question would be, well, I mean, we can, but should we, that's the kind of the live ball here, of should we hold them to this standard of expecting or how much we do or don't do? And I know that's just sort of putting a little bit more on the person, maybe that's, you know, has the wrongdoing here in this situation. I, I hear that. But I am just trying to see like that idea of what's a person or an individual's capacity as best we know, where does that give a little flexibility of the wrongdoing that someone is or isn't doing? I believe that, and this is a Kantian kind of framework, that one of the greatest things you can do as a way of respecting a person's agency mm -hmm. is to hold them accountable when they have done wrong done. Suggest that I respect you as a person who has rational capabilities, who know when something is bad and understands that when something is bad is done, the consequences and part of respecting their agential capacities to, to understand that is that I hold them accountable. Mm. Now, as you mentioned earlier in your example, is that there are certain people who just won't reach that thresh threshold yeah. of accountability. And that has to do with cognitive capacities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So if someone um, has a kind of is neurotypical, for example. We would not hold them right. accountable. In the law, we do not hold mm -hmm. them fully morally accountable, right? Now, neuro or, or kind of cognitive capacities are quite different from capacities of, I ain't doing that. This is how I'm going to be. I'm always going to be me. That's a very different. The capacity of, I'm going to try today. I'm not going to try today <laughs> is very different from neuroatypical capacities. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course. Very, very, very of course, different. Of course. Right. One points to its genes, the other one just points to lack of effort yes. Yes. and contentment. Yes. And what we end up doing a lot of time is also joining them in that laziness mm -hmm. and deciding to accept them for all that they are, flaws and all, to the point that we begin to excuse them for the wrongdoing that they engage in, and we don't hold them morally accountable. Yeah. Yeah. And what we end up doing <laughs> is perpetuating more harm in the world as a, as a, as a result. Mm -hmm. And we think that we're loving that person. But in the end, we're disrespecting them. So I think we all have the capacity. There's a certain individuals that don't fit that category. But we have the capacities to be morally accountable. And the greatest act of love that we can do is to hold people accountable. No matter if that's who they are or what they've done. To, I don't know how they want to define mm -hmm. their particular mm -hmm. actions or character. Mm -hmm. But we got to hold people accountable. That's how we love people. That's how we challenge people. That's how people are able to do better. That's how able, people are able to really um, understand what they've done so they can do better in the world. That's how we're able as a community to do our part to kind of bring about reconciliation and repair in our world, not just on behalf of the wrongdoer, but the victim itself. Mm -hmm. And when we don't do those things, because we know who they really mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? we don't protect, mm -hmm. we perpetuate more harm. And I think the challenge for all of us, and this goes to kind of one of the ways in which I can see of forgiveness, it's not just this individual thing that a victim does. And it's not this just individual thing that a wrongdoer goes and asks for the victim, that we all have a part to play. And when we don't play our part, repair can never be done. Reconciliation can never be done. And we just put more wrongdoing and more harm in the world as opposed to healing. Mm -hmm. I firmly agree with you. I think that robbing someone of their agency or their responsibility is the worst thing that we do a lot of the times. And, and I agree. I, there's a part of me personally that is always, well, we're all, we're all, we're all in this, this thing called life and we're at different journeys and some people are here and some people are here. And so trying to be mindful, but it doesn't mean that you should, you should do their job for them or, or allow them to be responsible. Um, so I, 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 Xavier, I, mean, I can't help but think about like R Kelly right now. 
<laughs> okay. I can't okay, help. Well, good, because I, I have three questions, uh, and okay. I want to ask you, uh, one of them is about cancel culture. That's another one okay. of the spicy bits in your book, which I, I yes. loved. Uh, I'll lay my cards out. I'm not a big fan of cancel culture. So you make the argument, you make two arguments there. You do say uh, canceling isn't always right, but you do leave uh, a a, a um, provision there of when it is. So maybe R. Kelly is a good case example here. And so so go ahead, keep going with, with R. Kelly. I was going to mention R. Kelly because when I think about how long R. Kelly was able to do the wrongdoing that he was convicted of, is not or did not happen because one person got away with everything. It happened and the extent of his victims and the period of time in which it was able to happen was able to happen because he had a community of people around him that helped him, that excused it, that facilitated it. And then he also had millions of fans around him who justified it, who ignored it. And so a community within itself (laughs) can perpetuate wrongdoing Mm -hmm. in the world because of the different parts that they play. And if that's the case when it comes to wrongdoing, a community of people also have a role to play to make sure that wrongdoing doesn't have the final say, that repair and release and reconciliation can come into view. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop thinking that only the victim or only the perpetrator has a role to play, that the community also has a role to play. I am not... um, for cancel culture. Okay. I think that anytime anything becomes a culture, um, we usually engage in it because a massive amount of people is doing it um, to the point that we don't really think critically about what we are engaging in. So I never want a kind of action such as canceling to come about as a result of following the herd and not thinking critically. Mm-hmm. And so just as I am against cancel culture, I'm also against mercy culture and forgiveness culture because I don't want us to extend mercy and forgiveness because everybody else is doing it or everybody expects for us to do it. And we engage in those particular practices, forgiveness, mercy, without thinking critically about what we're doing and the actions that we're engaging in and decisions that we're particularly making. So I'm against anything that becomes a culture, except hip hop culture. Oh. But I'm against, <laughs> I'm against forgiveness culture. I'm against cancel culture. I'm against mercy, mercy culture. Mm-hmm. But I am for canceling. Mm-hmm. Not in our interpersonal relationships. I'm against canceling when it comes to kind of transactional relationships that we have with celebrities. Mm-hmm. Right? Because I think that those relationships are transactional relationships. Um, I have yet to meet Lauren Hill and for her to become my best friend. <laughs> Up until then, same thing with LeBron. You know, Oprah, we will be best friends one day. But until then, we have a transactional relation. I have a transactional relationship with them, mm-hmm. right? It's that they provide certain kind of services and I decide to support or not to support. And if they decide to do something that I don't agree with, then I can withhold my support from them. And that will be an example of what I'm referring to as, as canceling. Now, I think in our interpersonal relationships, it is the case that we are in relationships with each other, like real relationships. That's not like a celebrity. And so because we are in these kind of real relationships, when wrongdoing happens, the kind of steps that we would take when it comes to celebrity is quite different because the relationship just dictates that we handle wrongdoing quite differently, right? I can't directly approach a celebrity, right? I can't ask them all these questions about the things that they've done and all this other stuff, nor do I have obligations toward them as far as the way in which I respond to them. But I do have that when it comes to my interpersonal relationships. And so I think, I think, we ought to treat them differently. Also, those interpersonal relationships are not transactional relationships. It's not like, hey, you give me this and I give you support. Like, that's not how our relations are. So we shouldn't duplicate transactional relationships. Um, and so, therefore, I think that we shouldn't cancel people who are close to us. Right. Because those are just not the kind of relationships that dictate a kind of canceling. And if we decide not to be in relationship with them anymore, let's just call it what it is. Let's just say we have not forgiven them or we are withholding withholding forgiveness. As far as canceling a little bit more, say, let me just say a little bit more why I think that has utility. Not cancel culture, as I just laid out, but, but, but canceling itself. Listen, I can do whatever I want to do with my money. But, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's totally fair. That's totally fair. You know what I mean? Like, if I, if I, you know, this is not a moral, I don't have a moral relationship <laughs> with any kind of celebrity or musician. Like, I do not have to give you my money. I do not have to press play on Spotify. I don't need to do these things. So I can do whatever I want. Now, how do I do it? There's some norms. Mm. 
because we are in moral relationships with each other, right? Now, me trying to destroy their lives <laughs> for no reason at all, it's just, it's just, come on, that's not morally defensible, mm -hmm. right? So there's certain kinds of ways that we ought to do it. I think calling people out on social media um, is not necessarily, ne not necessarily bad. I mean, I ought to do it informed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people just hear one right. rumor and they go with it. I need to do it informed. Um, I need to do it, you know, kind of with, with, with good intention, um, trying to relax myself a little bit more and make sure I don't, you know, do all the bad things that can happen when we do a lot of pile ones. Uh, but putting that aside, I don't think that's canceling. I think that's just canceling gone wrong. I think we can hold, you know, celebrities accountable for their actions. Um, and we can decide to withdraw our support. People call that canceling. And that's not, that's not a, that's not a problem. People have been doing it since, since, you know, the market came into, <laughs> I don't, I don't see what the problem is. It's like maybe perhaps in an American kind of capitalist society, we have a problem with people withdrawing their funds and <laughs> all this stuff. You know, you think about the civil rights movement, engaging in boycott and like, that was a huge deal. Like, you know, because I think when it comes to money and withdrawing our transactions, a capitalist society has tremendous problems with that. But let that be an issue for capitalism. I don't think it's an issue for morality. I can do whatever I want with my money, but I ought to do it in a way that respects other people, in a way that also respects me as a moral, moral agent and as a citizen as, as well. And I think there's a lot of people who do it morally. I think what we hear from is a lot of people who do it immorally. Uh, but we've been doing it since day one. We should continue to, to do it because we can take a stand, um, as the civil rights movement have, have taught us. We can take a stand with how we use our funds in ways that, that can achieve, you know, kind of aims of justice and morality. And I think that's, that's, that's perfectly fine. I think it's another tool. Just like forgiveness is a tool. I think canceling um, is a tool as well that we should, we, we should use it um, with good intentions. So, so and you, uh, use it carefully. So there, you, you've, 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 uh, you've taken all of your R. Kelly records out of your house and they're, uh, they're in the garbage. I never had any. <laughs> this R. Kelly thing has been a thing since I was a teenager. I know. It's I mean, been a on. really long time. It's really long I've time. Been before, <laughs> I've been known. I've been known. I guess the one, I guess, kind of uh, follow-up to that is, well, there are people too. I understand the transactional aspect, but, you know, aren't they, if they're role models, let's say they have a, a serious indiscretion and they do all the things they're supposed to do you know they go away for a little bit they they get treatment they have a public apology they have uh, i think um as an example of this is maybe michael vick right um because i think he kind of did this he did some terrible things yeah. for a good bit and um totally awful and then he went away for a bit. He, you know, couldn't play in the NFL. He didn't get a salary. He got treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is there a, again, this might, on the individual level, there might be like, well, I'm just not going to watch him throw a football. Like, that's just, I'm never going to do that. And that, you know, that's a person's right. Um, but I guess, is there like a, is there, I know each case is different, but is there, I think, in a societal level or in a cultural level, is there a lane where we say a person has wrongdoing, um, maybe that does say something about their character. But can they can they rectify it? Um, how do we kind of let them back into the public sphere? And, and what does that kind of look like? Again, different for each case. But and there are some cases I think would be absolutely um, no. <laughs> but mm -hmm. his is a kind of I guess tricky situation. But I mean, you can use his example. But how do you? Is there a space for that, or would you say, nope? No, I think I think it's a space for that. I think, and this is NRN here. I think we wouldn't have a political society if people couldn't come back in. All of us would be excluded <laughs> from moral yes, and political yes, life. <laughs> yes. Now, there's no doubt that what is done can complicate. And who does it and who is, who's it done to? And sometimes that doesn't happen to fairly depend, you know, things can go, go awry in that, in that sense. But even when it comes to like the criminal justice system, we were trying to figure out, you know, talk about this notion of the, uh, the collateral consequences of incarceration, mm -hmm. that person has already done their time. Mm -hmm. But when then when they try to reintegrate back into society, they can't get an apartment, they can't get a job. Yeah, I think that's a horrible way um, 
to, to offer a repair to someone, yeah. right? That's a, that's a horrible way. And there's been initiatives and organizations and laws created to make sure um, that they're able to get their, their, their rights back. That's a wonderful thing. That's a great thing. That's also different what society and, and politics and, and, and policies do. That's quite different from the victim mm -hmm. having to now live next door to that person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. totally, totally different. But I think society should create ways for people to re, re, reintegrate. Mm -hmm. And there, I think there's certain kinds of norms in relationship to certain kind of business entities about how mm -hmm. that's going, going, going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but what gets complicated, and I think a lot of things that have hit the news has to do with people actually breaking the law. Yeah, I've, I've certainly. Yes, of course. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Sexual yeah, assault. Are, in some ways, those are kind of the easy cases, right? Where it's just like... Yeah, no, well, you might think that they are the easy Some of these are pretty cases. easy. I mean, it's like, listen... You might think you, that they are the easy cases. broke multiple laws. Yeah. Okay. Like, you might think that they are the easy cases, but those are the cases that are being discussed. I think they're be, being more discussed than the person who had a drug, a drug issue. Yeah. I think we're more prone. I mean, there, there's been people in Hollywood had an issue with drugs, able to come back. You could read their memoirs. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I think as, as much as we like to think that certain like crimes per, per se are easy to answer. Mm -hmm. No, depending on who you are. Mm -hmm. If you are a man, if you are a white man, if you are a wealthy white man, mm -hmm. that, is, that question has already been answered. <laughs> right? And so I think, I think the challenge for us and uh, Martha Manow has a wonderful book called Should the Law Forgive? Mm -hmm. um, the question for us is to making sure that we are forgiving people equally, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're given second chances equally, despite class or fame or, or, or gender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you on all that. So last two here, one of the things towards the end of the book you talk about is how we forgive ourselves. Uh, yeah. And that can be really tough because sometimes I think there's this kind of uh, displacement of, you know, well, I'll forgive you. I yeah. can't forgive myself. That's sometimes the hardest. So how do we handle those? Or what are, what are your thoughts on handling feelings of self-blame and regret and shame and some of the things we've talked about here? How, 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 does, how does that look different, I guess, in forgiving oneself for things? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in the book is forgiving my stepfather was much easier than forgiving myself. And it's still a process. And particularly when someone dies and you think about what you could have done or who you could have been to them 24 hours out of the day. And when you're in your 20s, life is all about you and you begin to neglect your parents. That when they get sick and when they die, you're dealing with a whole bunch of stuff, right? And that is something that I have been dealing with. And that's been much harder than given a stepfather who happened to cheat on my mother while she was dying on her deathbed. Right? And I think, you know, there's certain kind of memories that I have that reminds me of my mom, that reminds me of certain kinds of childish behavior. Like, I get those memories, like, all the time. And so wrestling with, I call these moral remainders, wrestling with these remainders, wrestling with what Catherine Nolak refers to kind of these intrusive moments is hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the problem is the moments. I think this is just the moral remainders of not doing what I should have done. Right? Just because I'm sorry for what I've done don't necessarily mean it's going to leave. They stay. I mean, that's just what happens in the aftermath of wrongdoing. They, they stay. And so what I have to do is try to learn from the regret because mm -hmm. it's always a lesson, mm -hmm. right? What more regret teaches us is to do better next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they teach us. So I'm trying to do better, <laughs> trying to do better in the lives of people that I love mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm 24 seven with them. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because mm -hmm. I have to get over myself and my own ambitions, uh, but trying not to repeat and to have that same more regret that I have with my mom is a daily Daily, daily practice. And so as much as I have forgiven myself for not being the best daughter, I mean, I wasn't the worst daughter, but not being the best daughter, I had to live with, with regret. I had to live with remorse. And it's hard. And one of the ways that you can do it is to make sure, you know, guilt is motivating. <laughs> Shame, not so much. Right? We know from certain kinds of studies that guilt can, can motivate you to engage in altruistic behavior. Mm -hmm. And shame just makes you want to hide and beat up on yourself. 
Um, so I think the guilt is good. It motivates me just to do, do better. I think the regret is just gonna, it's gonna stay with me, but trying to get the lesson out of that to make sure I don't repeat it. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful um, movie that reminds me of, of this. Will Smith played in this, in this movie. Speaking of Will Smith, there's a YouTube video, the first YouTube video that he posted after the, the slap. One of the things that he explains in that video, he says, what I'm trying to do, and this is something I'm citing him here, is not to look at myself as a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I think that's the heart. You know, you, you forgave yourself for what you've done, and then how can you change the way that you look at yourself? I mean, that's a constant thing he's going to live, live with, and that's a constant thing that we live with. Mm -hmm. And I think self-reproach, making sure that we do that in a very healthy way, mm -hmm. that we're not a piece of shit, right? Um, we've done a shitty thing, mm -hmm. but we can do better. Mm -hmm. Right? We have the potential, we have the capacity to do better. How are we going to do better? And it's not like you're going to forget how you felt or what you did, but you got to use that as motivation to be a better human. Right? There's, a, there's a movie that Will Smith played in. What is that movie where he donates parts of his body? It's uh, to different people. And he's donating different parts of his, of his, of his body and doing all these kind of uh, altruistic things. Because he he's, can't forgive himself for the accident that he engaged in. He was in a car accident with his wife. This is the movie we're talking about, not the real life. Uh, right. The car accident with himself. It's not the pursuit of happiness, um, right? No, it's not that one. No, 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 no. He's in a car accident with himself, uh, with his wife, and he's on his phone because he's just obsessed with his career. And that leads him to get into an accident where, he, mm -hmm. where his wife dies and other people. Mm -hmm. And he can't forgive himself. And so the moral remainders, you see the flashbacks throughout the movie, the moral remainders, the regret, the remorse. He can't live with that. He can't learn from that. So in the end, I'm sorry, it's been out for a while. I'm going to you know, spoil it for you. <laughs> he just ends up doing all these altruistic things and eventually end up killing himself mm. so that his heart can go to someone else that he, that he met. Mm. And so he can't live with himself, not because of the regret, not because of the remorse, not because of the intrusive moments or memories. He can't live with himself because he hasn't forgiven mm -hmm. himself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think if we begin to forgive ourselves, then that sets the stage for us to live with the remorse, to live with the regret, mm -hmm. and to learn from it so that we can be better in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's, that was what I was going to end with was how, how do we have this wider view of forgiveness, you know, and interpersonally, interpersonally, and, and, and at a societal culture level. But uh, it sounds like that, that's it. How do we how do we forgive ourselves? How do we we learn from those elements of regret, and and you know keep carrying forward? Uh, Maisha, this has been such a such a wonderful wonderful time, such a wonderfully thought provoking conversation, which is exactly how I wanted it. It's how the book is. Uh, the book is oh, failures of forgiveness: what we get wrong and how to do better. Um, where is the best places to um, to find yourself and to find your work? Well, if anyone is interested, I uh, have a website, MaishaCherry.org, or you can catch me on all the social medias at MaishaCherry. It's the same tag. And all the sites, X. <laughs> can we call it X? Should we call it X? No, Twitter. Let's call it Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. You can find me. You can find me there. You can also find me on, on, on Book Tour. Um, that's going to begin as soon as the, the book comes out, September 19th. I'll be in a few cities on the East Coast and then headed to the West Coast. Uh, but pre-order the book, order the book, read the book, share the book. That will be greatly appreciative. Maisha, big, big, big thanks. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much. I have such, such a wonderful time here. Likewise.